Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 69, Space Shuttle Flight 2, STS-2. Columbia flies again. Before we get into today's mission, I have a brief correction to make. As I've hopefully made clear, I'm not some super expert in spaceflight history. Each episode, and especially each new vehicle, takes a fair amount of research, and I'm still learning my way around the shuttle. So it wasn't shocking when I learned that I had flubbed a bit in the last episode. While I regret making the mistake, I'm delighted that I have such a knowledgeable and engaged listenership that I even have an opportunity to make this correction. So thanks to Ray Coring for the helpful email. As always, you can send your own corrections, clarifications, or other feedback to jp at thespaceabove.us. In the STS-1 episode, I mentioned how the plan for a transoceanic abort landing involved the pilot loading the landing software into the backup computer as the abort was underway. It turns out that I misunderstood my source, and this wasn't quite right. Instead, for this flight, the plan would be for Crippen to bring up the displays of the backup computer, which had been running the entire time. Then, as Young used his displays from the primary computers to control the vehicle, Crippen would verbally relay the information required to get to the emergency landing site. In later flights, the software was updated such that this verbal exchange of information was no longer necessary. Ray also clarified exactly how the voting system worked between the primary computers. Each computer would do their calculations independently, and then at a prearranged time, several hundred times per second, would meet up to compare results. If a computer was early, it would just wait until the prearranged meetup time. If a computer consistently took too long or provided different results, it would be booted from the group. The crew could then manually flip a switch to have the backup computer join the primary computers. The backup computer would not join on its own. Lastly, Ray mentioned something that I had cut for time but now just can't resist. Re-entry in a suitcase. Again, the shuttle computers were beasts compared to Apollo, but they didn't have enough memory to load all of the software required for the entire mission all at one time. So you'd start off with Ascent software, then once on orbit you'd switch to the main mission software, and then before coming home you'd load in the re-entry software. While the software loading process was not expected to give them any trouble, out of an abundance of caution NASA took an extra safety measure on STS-1. Included on the flight was a sixth computer already preloaded with the entry software. If the crew were unable to load the entry software into the primary computers, this sixth computer could be physically swapped with one of the normal computers and then used to fly home. And when I say physically swapped, I mean it was completely offline in a locker somewhere. The crew would have to go get it, remove one of the other computers, and then put the sixth computer in. Hence, re-entry in a suitcase. Thanks for keeping me on my toes, Ray. Last time, we finally kicked off the space shuttle program with STS-1. The two-day flight was most notable for coming back at all, which is always a question on initial test flights. But John Young and Bob Crippen proved that Columbia was a fine ship, even tolerating a few missing tiles from its critical thermal protection system and a re-entry that deviated somewhat from expected conditions. STS-1 showed the world that the orbiter could survive ascent and a lengthy and complex re-entry, but there was still an important capability that Columbia had yet to demonstrate. Reusability. That capability would fall to STS-2 to prove. While I'd bet that more people have heard the story of STS-1, STS-2's reuse of a spacecraft was a historic milestone. By my count, there were only two previous vehicles that had been to space more than once. First was X-15 No. 3, which performed a number of extremely high-altitude flights, including two flown by Joe Walker that crossed the somewhat arbitrary 100-kilometer boundary to space. Of course, neither of those flights were orbital. They essentially went straight up and straight down. After that, bonus points if you can remember this one, was the Gemini spacecraft first flown on Gemini 2. Gemini 2 was a 1966 uncrewed suborbital test of the Gemini spacecraft lasting less than 20 minutes. But the capsule actually flew again the following year as part of the Manned Orbiting Laboratory program, 
The MOL guys were hoping to cut a tunnel through the heat shield back to the main part of MOL. So they needed to be sure that a tunnel hatch in the heat shield would withstand reentry. The hatch held up just fine, but the same couldn't be said for the MOL program. So on STS-2, Columbia would become the third spacecraft to fly in space more than once, but the first to do so on orbital flights. The planned five-day flight was tasked with once again testing Columbia's spaceworthiness, along with running a few experiment payloads and a new critical piece of shuttle hardware, the Remote Manipulator System, or Canadarm. This versatile robotic arm would enable astronauts to perform elaborate tasks outside of the spacecraft without actually leaving the comfort of the crew cabin. The arm was 15 inches in diameter and 50 feet long. To put that into perspective with an everyday object, I've seen it compared to a telephone pole. The arm itself weighed 900 pounds on Earth and was initially capable of dealing with loads of around 700 pounds, though they eventually upped it to over 7,000 pounds. By taking advantage of the six degrees of freedom provided by the shoulder, elbow, and wrist joints, as well as a grappling mechanism at the tip, the Canadarm was an incredibly useful piece of equipment. So thanks, Canadian Space Agency! The mission would also build on the data gathered by STS-1's re-entry. For STS-1, the trajectory was as conservative as possible, since so little was known about what to expect. But since Young and Crippen had established a baseline, STS-2's goal was to probe the edges of the flight envelope a bit. The flight commander, who we'll get to in a second, summed up the rationale in an oral history, saying, quote, You just don't know when you may have a payload you weren't able to deploy, so you have maybe the center of gravity not in the optimum place and you can't do anything about it, and just how much maneuvering will you be able to do with that vehicle in that condition? How much control authority is really out there on the elevons? And how much cross-range do you really have if you need to come down on an orbit that is not the one you really intended to come down on? End quote. Flying STS-2 would be NASA's last all-rookie crew, though the commander might take umbrage at being called a rookie. That's because he was the first NASA rookie to walk in the door already wearing astronaut wings. Joe Engel was born on August 26, 1932, in Dickinson County, Kansas. He picked up a degree in aeronautical engineering from the University of Kansas and began flying with the Air Force soon after that. He eventually found his way to, contain your surprise, test pilot school, flying the skies above Edwards Air Force Base. In 1963, he joined the X-15 program, where he flew a total of 16 times. His fastest flight was Mach 5.71, but more relevant to this show, his highest flight was over 85 kilometers. That may be under the 100 kilometer limit used by most of the world, but it did clear the 50 mile limit used by the Air Force to qualify for astronaut wings. And actually, as far as I know, NASA rookie astronauts still start celebrating as they pass the 50 mile mark during ascent, not 100 kilometers. As the only X-15 pilot to fly the shuttle, Engel brought a unique experience to the table, having already flown hypersonic entries. And that experience would be called upon during the experimental re-entry planned for this mission. And I'm sure that his experience as commander during the approach and landing tests flying Enterprise would help too. Joining Engel and flying as pilot was Dick Truly. Richard Truly was born on November 12, 1937, in Fayette, Mississippi. He too earned a degree in aeronautical engineering, but from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Truly joined up with the Air Force, flying F-8 Crusaders and making over 300 carrier landings. In 1963, he moved to the Air Force Aerospace Research Pilot School, first as a student and then as an instructor. In 1965, he joined up with the doomed Manned Orbiting Laboratory program, where he remained until its cancellation in 1969. After joining NASA, decidedly at the back of the line, he performed various support roles and served as Capcom during Skylab. We last saw Truly flying Space Shuttle Enterprise alongside Engel four years earlier as part of the approach and landing tests. Fun fact, Truly would go on to become the first astronaut to serve as NASA Administrator. 
The second flight of the space shuttle was scheduled well after the first one, so that engineers would have plenty of time to chew on the data generated by STS-1, make tweaks and repairs to the vehicle, and be ready to go without unnecessary pressure. While everyone was eager to get flying again, you don't want to rush something like this. And it's a good thing that there was no huge rush, because the original launch date of October 9th went out the window in late September when some RCS fuel was spilled while being loaded into the forward RCS module in the orbiter's nose. If you've ever seen the technicians that work with hypergolic fuels, you'll immediately notice that they appear to be wearing spacesuits. They're not quite spacesuits, but they're not that far off either. The nitrogen tetroxide hypergolic fuel used by the shuttle's reaction control system is just awful stuff. Super toxic, super bad for people, and really not great for anything else either. The spill messed up the bond between the orbiter and a few hundred thermal insulation tiles, requiring them to be replaced. Lucky for everyone, this was possible while Columbia remained stacked on the launch pad. Otherwise, they would have had to roll all the way back to the VAB, potentially de-stack, and roll over to the orbiter processor facility. Instead, everything was ready to go again in 45 days. Except, whoops, not quite. High pressure in APU-1 and APU-3 during the first launch attempt caused a scrub and a further 8-day delay. The APUs, which stand for Auxiliary Power Unit, were critical pieces of hardware that were responsible for powering the orbiter's hydraulic systems, which in turn powered the control surfaces and the main engine vector controls. The APUs burn hydrazine, another nasty fuel, and operate during ascent and entry. Once APU 1 and 3 were fixed, launch day finally arrived, for realsies this time, on November 12, 1981. As Columbia sat on the pad waiting to launch, just seven months after its first mission, it presented a sight that no one would ever see again. That's because this was the last flight with a white external tank. The giant propellant tank was originally painted white out of concern about the ultraviolet part of the harsh Florida sun damaging the delicate insulating foam. After this flight, they determined that sending a few hundred pounds of white paint into space wasn't necessary, and from STS-3 onwards, the tank was the burned orange color that we're all familiar with today. If you're feeling nostalgic, though, just go grab a space shuttle program patch. The triangular patch with the distinctive space plane still sports a white tank. The launch was further delayed by almost three hours. First to replace a broken multiplexer demultiplexer unit, which was actually snagged from OV-099, who we'll be meeting in a few episodes. The second delay, of only 10 minutes, is officially listed as a, quote, confidence review of system status. But one source I found says that it was to allow for a reconnaissance satellite to scope out the orbiter later in the mission. After learning about similar efforts in STS-1, this makes sense to me. And a status check is a great way to buy a few minutes. Sneaky. At 10.10 a.m., the long wait was over, the engines and SRBs lit up, and Columbia was flying again. This time, the sound suppression system had been beefed up, so the shockwave generated by SRB ignition did not cause any damage. The SRBs separated at 2 minutes and 10 seconds, and Engel and Truly claimed that Young and Crippen did not warn them about the dramatic light show caused by the separation motors, so that was a fun surprise. The twin SRBs fell back to Earth, deploying their series of parachutes before being recovered in the Atlantic Ocean. When recovered, engineers noticed something unusual. It seemed that the aft field joint on the right-hand solid rocket booster had leaked superheated gas, causing some erosion to the rubber O-ring that sealed the joint. The item was apparently of such low concern that while follow-up tests were conducted, it did not even make the list of anomalies in the STS-2 mission report. But it was on this flight, only the second, that this troubling symptom first appeared. It would not be the last. The remainder of the ascent went smoothly, with the SSMEs falling silent after 8 minutes and 33.8 seconds. A 77-second ohms burn ensured that Columbia would not re-enter alongside its propellant tank, and a second ohms burn of 69.2 seconds, half an hour later, 
placed the spacecraft into its final orbit around 230 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. But as Engel and Truly got out of their seats and got to work putting the shuttle into its on-orbit configuration, all was not well. Two hours and 27 minutes into the mission, ground controllers got their first indications that Fuel Cell 1 was having trouble. Just like in the Apollo days, the shuttle used three fuel cells to generate electricity. Since the electricity was generated by combining hydrogen and oxygen, a convenient byproduct was drinkable water for the crew. The orbiter carried three fuel cells, but they were so critical that the loss of just one required the mission to be cut short. The risk was that if there was an issue that affected all three fuel cells, then you could lose the other two before getting home. And since you can't operate the shuttle without electricity, that was a deal breaker. So almost right away, the five-day mission was cut down to 54 hours, just over two days in duration. Cutting a mission short like this is a gut punch to the crew, not only because they had waited so long to fly their mission, but also because these are extremely goal-oriented people, and they wanted to complete all of their mission objectives. With the time allotted, there was simply no way this was doable. But the crew had to trick up their sleeves to gain some unallotted time. These days, NASA operates the Tracking and Data Relay Satellite System, or TDRS. This small fleet of communication satellites flying at geosynchronous altitude enables communication with NASA's large number of crewed and uncrewed spacecraft in Earth orbit. Well, as long as you schedule your Compass three weeks in advance, at least. This is important, since with a TDRS satellite usually in view, and with TDRS always in view of ground stations, it's pretty much always possible for a spacecraft to route a signal through TDRS and to the ground. The alternative is to wait to pass over a ground station. As we've covered as far back as the Mercury days, NASA had, and still has, a pretty extensive network of ground stations across the surface of the Earth. But when you're in a really low orbit, they can't see you for that long as you quickly fly from one end of the horizon to the other. This means that in the pre tedris days, it was possible to go for long stretches, sometimes hours, without communication with the ground. Why am I telling you all this? Because for STS-2, TDRS was not yet in place. So Columbia and its crew would enjoy long periods of time with no ground communications. So when the scheduled sleep period arrived, the crew said goodnight and made like they were going to sleep. But once they were out of range of listening ground stations, they got to work. The determined crew spent all night testing the robot arm in the payload bay. For this mission, there was nothing for the arm to grab onto or move around. The crew was just evaluating how it performed and how comfortable it was to operate. And in a testament to the quality of the controls and the quality of the procedures worked out by fellow astronaut Sally Ride, the crew turned the tip of the arm around and pointed its camera back at the aft crew cabin windows, where Angle and Truly grinned for the camera and held up a sign that said, What else? Hi, Mom. But I guess the crew wasn't quite as sneaky as they thought. Mission controller Don Putty says that they knew the crew was up to something by looking at the electricity usage on board, which is pretty high for a couple of guys who were supposed to be fast asleep. The fuel cell problem also led to a problem that we haven't seen since the Apollo days. Bubbly water. That is, the drinking water had tiny hydrogen bubbles in it. On its own, this is pretty harmless. On Earth, you might not even notice. You'd burp a little more, but it wouldn't exactly hold you back. But in space, you can't burp. Burping requires the gas to rise at the top of your stomach so it can be let out. In space, the gas just stays all mixed up with the liquid in your stomach. So if you do burp, you might get more than you bargained for. This meant that the gas had to go the other way, which led to uncomfortable bloating. Add on top of that the fact that the water took much longer to dispense, and the crew had plenty of reason to avoid the drinking water. So now not only are Engel and Truly tired from staying up all night evaluating the robot arm, but they're pretty dehydrated too. This made for a pretty rough mission. Last episode, I sort of made light of the idea that none of the assigned tasks were particularly tricky, but I don't think I really conveyed just how busy the crew was. Just keeping the shuttle in working order with a crew of two is challenging enough on its own. The fact that these guys were getting anything done at all, especially given the circumstances, 
is pretty impressive. Part of what they were getting done involved keeping an eye on the shuttle's first payloads. The OSTA-1 pallet carried seven instruments for studying the Earth and the payload bay environment in the back of the shuttle. And since I know you're dying to know, OSTA stood for the Office of Space and Terrestrial Applications. The instruments were useful on their own, but also allowed NASA to demonstrate the shuttle's capability as a stable platform for science. The payloads required tighter attitude tolerances than had been needed on STS-1. By satisfying those attitude requirements, NASA proved that the orbiter was able to carry sophisticated experiments without all the hassle of launching them on their own satellite. Notably, one item on the payload manifest, or maybe not, was the shuttle's first classified payload. Part of the price to pay for the Department of Defense's support of the shuttle when NASA needed help with Congress was their cooperation on a number of classified payloads and missions. For many of these classified items, we still have to guess at details, but we can make educated guesses. In this case, the payload seems to have been some sort of prototype sensor for missile detection. Classified payloads are a giant headache. It requires keeping mission details away from a large number of people involved in making the mission work. It requires dealing with a whole new group of people with a different organizational culture, which comes with communication issues no matter who the group is, but I'd bet especially with the DoD. And it also requires roundabout secrecy when it comes to stuff like radio calls. In this case, each item in the payload checklist had its own code name. Near the end of the mission, the crew had packed the payload up locked it away, and were preparing for deorbit. Then, a radio call came up with a code word from the classified checklist. They couldn't remember what it was, so they got out of their seats, opened up the safe, pulled out the checklist, and looked up the code word, which instructed them to be sure to put the payload and checklist back in the safe before coming home. <laughs> Whoops. Far sooner than anyone had planned, it was time for Columbia to come home again. The crew was tired dehydrated, overworked, and frustrated that their mission was cut short. So the last thing they needed was for something to go wrong with the landing. Of course, this meant that pilot Dick Truly chose this time to accidentally get some of the medication from his anti-nausea skin patch into his eyes, which then dilated, leaving his vision blurry and mostly useless. Truly did what he could to assist during the entry, but it largely fell on Angle's shoulders to execute more than 20 pre-planned control inputs in order to evaluate Columbia's handling characteristics. Space trivia buffs will likely expect me to now mention that this was the only fully manual entry flown in the entire space shuttle program. But that would be wrong, since that didn't actually happen here. That's not to take anything away from Angle's stellar piloting, of course. But what the STS-2 commander was actually required to do was to perform manual inputs at the full range of flight regimes during re-entry, not the entire entry. That is, while the computer flew most of the entry, Engel put his X-15 experience and NASA training to work and took manual control several times at a wide range of speeds to test how the spacecraft performed. Though I have no doubt that if given the chance, Engel would have gladly attempted and probably successfully completed a fully manual entry. As Columbia soared through the familiar skies over Edwards Air Force Base, Engel couldn't resist a nod to his old test pilot stomping grounds. As Engel tells it, though I couldn't find it in the landing audio or transcript, he called out over the radio, Eddie Tower, it's Columbia rolling out on high final. I'll call the gear on the flare. The controller at Edwards Tower, who knew Engel, didn't miss a beat and called out, Roger Columbia, you're cleared number one, call your gear which would be sure to cause some confusion back in Houston. 54 hours, 13 minutes, and 12 seconds after lifting off, Columbia touched down at Edwards Air Force Base, rolling nearly 8,000 feet in 50 seconds before coming to a stop. Columbia was home again. The mission had been about half as long as anticipated, but thanks to a crew that didn't know how to quit, over 90% of the mission objectives were successfully completed. And more importantly, OV-102 was back home again in one piece. For the first time, a piloted orbital spacecraft had flown, landed, 
flown, and landed again. It was the start of a new era. But as Columbia ushered in the start of a new era, the end of an old era was still echoing. Next time, we'll learn how STS-3 nearly flew to a certain parasol-wielding space station that we all know and love. But perhaps as revenge for exposing its secrets, the sun decided not to cooperate, and it was not meant to be. Don't worry, though. STS-3 will still make its own unique and very dusty contribution to the shuttle program. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. (laughs) 